Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well and healthy. And thank you for joining us and welcome to Speculative Existence, Human Experiences and Technology of the Future. My name is Ninjani from Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Nusantara, or Museum Machan, and I'm going to be the host for this online event. Today, we will hear from three artists who present their multimedia works at Museum Machan as part of the fourth PH Award, Asia's Leading Award for New Media Artists organized by Hyundai Motor Group. Before we dive into the discussion, allow me to share a little bit about the presentation and also the project. Established in 2016 by the Hyundai Motor Group, the VH Award supports the discovery and exhibition of emerging and new media artists from various Asian contexts. The fourth edition, hosted and awarded in 2021, was the first to expand beyond Korea to include artists whose work creatively portray and reflect the vast array of approaches to media art occurring across Asia. The presentation at Museum Ai Chan features the works of all finalists of the fourth VH Award, including the London-based Grand Prix winner, Lauren Sleck, Doreen Chan, who is currently based in Chicago, Paribertana Mohanti, who lives and works in New Delhi, and Seoul-based artist Jungwon So, and also Yogyakarta-based artist Shaura Kotronada. Their works engage with te technology in new ways and forge new connections, addressing subjects that range from humanity's relationship with artificial intelligence to the pressing social and ecological issues of our time. The exhibition at Museum Machan is part of a series worldwide presentations of the finalist's work that has included a private screening at the new museum during Freeze New York, online presentation with Electra an international media and contemporary digital art organization based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and an upcoming on-site presentation at Ars Electronica Festival, which is one of the world's most important media art festival. So uh, that's a glimpse of the PH Award. And today we will hear from three participating artists who have joined us from all over the globe. We have Shaura joining us from Indonesia, Pari joining us from India, and also Lawrence joining us from the UK. Each artist will do a 15 to 20 minute presentation on their practice and also the artwork that, that they submitted uh, to the VH Award. And also to follow up the presentation, we will have a discussion with the artists together with Asri Winata, Assistant Curator of Museum Achan. So that's the agenda for today. And um, without further ado, allow me to introduce our speakers for um, uh, the presenters today. So um, we have three presenters, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, the presenters, um, the first presenter will be Shaura Katrunade. Um, she is an Indonesian artist who likes to do experiments with various medium, including photography, interactive art, paper, recycling, video art, digital archives, installation, and also publication materials. And her work mostly talks about music, history, education, and social issues. And today she will share about her practice and in particular her work, Fluidity of Future Machines. Shaura, are you ready? Okay, so without further ado, Shaura, whenever you're ready, and um, let's share um, her presentation as well. Sorry, sorry, you are mute. I'm still mute. You can hear you now. You can hear? Okay. Hello. Yeah. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Shaura, one of the finalists of Port PH Work. Thank you for sparing your time to watch our discussion today. Uh, okay, basically, I have a 
formal education background in photography and mechanical engineering. My works are mostly based on personal experience, both from my own or people around me, which extended with uh, literature research. I have big interest in history, music, education, and social issues. Um, I do lots of reading, writing, and talk with people in my free time. Um, I started to be involved in the art community in 2013, back when I was living in Jogja. Uh, it started with a few group exhibitions with students, also collaborative works and research projects with cultural institutions around Jogja and Solo. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, as you all see, these were my earliest projects. This one is called Joget, the um, in the left side up. Uh, at that time, I worked with uh, an alumni team to create a few thousands of old print photographs, so it can be arranged into a one uh, minute stop motion. This work was later on exhibit in Colorado in 2014. And in the same year, Ruang Mass 56 also invited me to be involved in their three months residency program with three other art practitioners. Um, this residency program introduced me to, to broader contemporary cultural practices in Jogja. Um, and other than those two, I also start my internship in Rolling Stone Indonesia as a journalist that year. Next. Oh, no, no, back, back. Uh, in 2015, I initiated my first collective project called Lokananta Project. It was a two-year collective project along with Lokananta Studio um, students and music journalists to collect and digitize physic physical audio visual archives. The studio... Oh, the studio itself was built by Indonesia government back in 1956 as a record factory, which uh, saved audio visual artifacts from many areas in Indonesia. So we are not only collecting the music, but also covers, articles, and do interviews with some of uh, the ex-employees. Um, and this project resulted in the form of book, which you can see in the left, bottom left, and a uh, digital library. While doing Lokananta project, I've also been invited to be involved in the Jogja Biennale Hacking Conflict in Indonesia with Nigeria to do research and create artwork about the Alita, which presented in uh, next to the Lokananta art book. Um, the Alita is a choir consisting of ex-political prisoners that were caught back in the 1965 communism massacre in Indonesia. There are, um, and I did research about uh, it and meet some of the people and create artwork from that. Um, there are a few group exhibitions happening in 2015 and most of the work are in collaboration with more experienced artists. Next. This is the first residency that I mentioned before with Long Mass 56. And next, Lokananda Project. Next. Uh, yeah, moving forward to my practice after graduating from school, I focus more on creating projects with artist collectives, public workshops, and more seriously developing my personal research project. I did a project with a friend who lived in New Zealand called Sambung Hamba. It was started as an Instagram account that was made for us to do exquisite crops game online. And when she came back to Indonesia in 2017, we developed the project into creating 
physical and performative artworks. So we make the like imaginary community identity card from leftover papers. Um, this one is one of the important projects which later also helped me to connect with other art collectives in Bandung, Jakarta, and Bogor. Next. Yeah, this one is still with uh, Dialita. Next, uh, Dialita Sambung Hambar. Next. Next. Oh, yeah, okay. You can start from that. Um, I didn't do much in 2019 for arts because that year I'm also working as a freelance graphic designer and photographer. But that year I published a comic for a zine uh, with a friend from Toronto and did a public workshop in Salihara community in the next slide, which related to Dialita. Dialita, the project that I did in Jogja Biennale in 2015. Next slide. Many students join this workshop and have casual conversations with um, one of the witnesses of the 1965 events while reinterpreting the Alita songs into drawings in wooden package. Uh, I also developed the research about Indonesian loanwords next. I also developed the research about Indonesian loan words, which was initially started with uh, when I'm working with Sampung Hambar. After the project finished, I still work on it and develop the paper materials that are used uh, for, that, that are previously used for identity card into sculptures and photo installation in the next slide. Next. So about the trilogy video, um, at the end of 2019, a friend of mine, Adi Winanto Somali, which later be my long-term collaborator for the trilogy, visited me in uh, my studio in Jogja while I'm working on my paper sculptures. Uh, and he asked me if he could record the process of making them. And, uh, by the way, the paper uh, that I've used are collected from rejected thesis drafts from university students. So that's why the trilogy focused on um, education themes and how it is formed and impacts our daily life. So yeah, next. Mm, so yeah, this is the all of the three video trailer. Uh, the there are three different time layers. Uh, first is history, which are um, you can which you can see in the top with red backgrounds. Uh, it's called the fattest life at the fair, and in the left side uh, is the uh, video processing, a uh, paper processing video. And in the bottom is footage of future machines, which uh, I created during PH work. Next. So in this diagram, you can see how these three works are related to each other and what are the keywords of each videos that I mentioned in uh, each of the videos. So, um, yeah, to understand about uh, the trilogy, you can see the keywords and watch it 
and also uh, there are several key visual elements that I always used in these three videos. It's a loan words, loan words text, um, and uh, uh, the characters of voiceover. So um, each of video have different characters, but it's like in a family. Uh, for example, the one that talk about the past is uh, told like a storytelling by a mother figure, and the paper process is um, narrated by like a child, like uh, very in a very childish manner. And uh, for the fluidity of future machines, it's narrated by an old man. Next. Next. Um, so yeah, the process of making fluidity of future machines is, it started with, I do some test cam because I already make the previous two. So in this video, I already like have some plan to uh, use microscopic footage. So I try, I, I visit my friend in Bandung who have a new laboratory. He collect microscopes and I told him that I, can I, can I just try doing test cam in your lab? Because I think I will make some video with uh, your tools, I will need it. So yeah, I, I do some test cam and uh, write the script after reading books, watching movies, and talk with people. Um, and yeah, basically the idea already formed since the beginning about the um, script. And then next, this is the process in the lab helped by um, my friend to shoot because I need to, to uh, and we work in three different th three different cities in Jogja, Jakarta, and Bandung because at that time the second pandemic uh, break. So uh, the mobility is really hard. Uh, so we need to work uh, remotely. Next. This is the residency program uh, meetings. And uh, the residency itself, uh, um, give, give, me, give me a lot of new perspective about how to make artworks, how to, um, how to create text as a performative uh, subjects. So talking with um, people in this program is really helped me to develop the work visually, both visually and uh, in the narratives. And uh, yeah, but yeah, so at the residency program, I, I work in the morning and then at night we do meetings. It's like, a, every week or two weeks, once a week or once two, every two weeks. Then, yeah, I think that's it, my slides. So uh, most of my work is collaborative and organic in nature. I work with support from a lot of people around me. And in my opinion, it is quite impossible to work on things that are related to technology without diverse perspectives because technology is like the tool to make our life easier. So the process of using and creating them needs many different points of view to be effectively beneficial for us. Thank you. Thank you, Siaura, for um, this uh, presentation. Uh, it gives us our, um, a better understanding about your practice and also your collaborative approach. Um, uh, yeah, in, in your uh, in your works that you've developed over the past decades, uh, so to say. So um, up next, uh, our second speaker 
is um, Pari Bertana Mohanti or Pari. He is a storyteller working with video, performance lecture, painting, writing, and also curation. Growing up in the coastal East Indian state of Odisha and now lives in Delhi, Pari Bertana remains driven by the ecological concerns of his home region. And today he will share about his practice and also uh, in particular the work Rise, Hunger, Sorrow that is um, presented as part of the VH Award. So Pari, uh, if you're ready, the screen is yours. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Neen and uh, Asri and uh, Macan Museum and the VHR for giving me this opportunity. I'm excited also. <laughs> I still feel uh, nervous. Uh, I have two laptops. I made my notes. I have pain to <laughs> make points or something. So what I did, uh, I divided my presentation in two parts. First part is a video compilation uh, of my previous video works. It's about five minutes. I'll be showing the video and sim simultaneously I will talk uh, about it. And second part is about rice, uh, rice, hunger and sorrow, which is presently displayed at Macon Museum. Uh, I'll talk about my travel questions and about collaborations and uh, the post-environment disaster landscapes, which I encountered through this project. Let's start with apparatus. Uh, it's a three minute video loop made in 2011. The work illustrates how camera functions in public life and its effects in present time. The image of time will be replaced by the image of dead animals. As the name, as the title suggests, the work replaces the found image of dead clocks in Fukushima with the image of dead animals collected from various natural history museums around the world. Straight to the nineteen. Yeah. It's the hour. It's eleven eleven. No, it's ten forty eight. Ten forty eight. I started the project Dear Document Fukushima after my visit to nuclear contaminated zone of Fukushima in 2014. I approached the documentation. It, it was so overwhelming because you, you can't see radiation. So, and but there is a constant fear. So I started documenting and I treat the documentation after coming back to India as individual entity, not as a reference to the crisis, uh, but as a, as a layout for horror vacui. Harabhakui is a term used by French cartographers. Here you see an image of a victim. I was long interested in this idea of victim because all images of victim, I feel they are political. This is, this is a excerpt from the video called Miniaturist, where I juxtapose images of Hiroshima Peace Museum, the images of object displayed at Hiroshima Peace Museum and object from national Museum Harappa Gallery. And the video talks about archaeological time, deterioration, the process of deterioration, that how uh, archaeological time takes, you know, the uh, deterioration through archaeological time, which takes a longer time, but through nuclear disaster, it takes a minute of seconds. The video also talks about Oppenheimer, the physicist, guilt and trial, Bizad, the painter, person painter, blindness and colors, metals, and even flesh. 
during this during this research i was reading a lot about what was that first nuclear uh, experiment happened and why how people saw at it look at it so everybody talks about color so color was evident transformation this is a clip from the video uh, it's more of a public audition and performance project called act the victim where i was asking people to perform as victims in front of a camera i traveled with this project to tokyo jerusalem in my own fancy and pre occupations and assumptions i thought in israel and in jerusalem and tokyo people will claim themselves as victims but you know every culture has a different way or approach though they the way they understand uh, themselves as victim or they want to portray or not here in tokyo someone is performing uh, a patient called hikikomori hikikomori is a mental disease where uh, during the adolescent time if young boys if they are bullied or something they draw back from the society here to young boys trying to kill the tree because they said we can't perform the victim we can perform the perpetrator through repetition and retakes and real cell we improvise and develop each act here there are some tourist foreigners uh, i met in tokyo they were confused but so we had a long conversation and at the day end they find uh, themselves victim as uh, from the tax paying uh, like as tax payers they feel they are victims here i asked uh, is a interactive performance so i asked a group of people to divide themselves based on religion caste or gender so they divided on based like who is wearing glass and all uh, these two girls are theater actor in jerusalem i met uh, there is a book uh, called the book uh, i asked them to perform the book and what was that victim they associate to they talked about the guilt of uh, guilt of not being able to do anything uh, about uh, israeli occupation in jerusalem so the one girl was carrying the other girl as uh, a as a arab man and the guild so here we are moving towards the second uh, part of the presentation uh, the project called rice hunger sorrow in odia i call it bhato bhukko dukho uh, literally translated rice hunger sorrow but i am using these words metaphorically stands for image circulation and crisis the project started with my anxiety of living in delhi one anxiety uh, one sense of anxiety comes from uh, surviving 18 years in a highly polluted contaminated populated politically hyper city where you always feel safe and another sense of anxiety comes from living far from odisha uh, that's my birth place where recurring cyclone and tsunamis have uh, become part of everyday culture so from this 3000 km distance Uh, between delhi and odisha uh, one encounters thousands of images flooding in on the internet after uh, any disaster take place which kind of create uh, which kind of uh, create a sense of premature apocalypse in your head and you always feel a, a, uh, what unsafe though in delhi you feel safe but then you will unsafe because you feel other part of the world is uh kind of falling you know the way it's happening now in pakistan like there is flood is happening you are here but you feel okay the other part of the world is falling this image kind of changed my perception the way i looked at crisis uh perhaps covid was the peak in our collective experiencing of environment disaster this image was challenging because before this i tried a lot to create a digital image of apocalypse using various software ai special effect and all uh, but at the end after seeing this image uh, uh, let me tell you what is special about this image so this image is taken in the evening uh, of the first covid lockdown in a children park in delhi which should be crowded but it was empty so this image told me okay this is an apocalypse and we are living in it 
it's not in the future somewhere uh, but there is no sense visually you don't need any special effect to present that glorious glossy image what uh, hollywood feeding us and it's in future uh, so what i realized from my uh, my thinking that failure of technology is apocalyptic crisis begins when all form of technological mediation all of a sudden breaks or gets interrupted so the, so that was my conclusion from this uh, image this pushed me to think about uh, the role of new communication technology particularly in semi urban and rural place of odisha where i belong one um, on one side new technology in particular in smaller cities it's is spreading a sense of democracy in the mass and on the uh, and on the other side through the process of digitalization algorithm algorithmic networking circulation tagging tracing surveillance and censorship uh, this new technology are changing our perception about climate change with these simple questions i traveled nearly 10000 km uh, near the coast of uh, bay of bengal in odisha i covered six coastal districts to see and document how new uh, environment disaster landscapes emerging or evolving in the coastal districts of odisha was overwhelming for me you yeah, here i want to show like after 99 uh, super cyclone how the cyclones has been frequent uh, for the people who doesn't know odisha is placed on the eastern part of india it's one of the site uh, one of the state considered as poor but full of natural resources it full of god and ghost stories uh so because of natural resources it's always a conflict zone uh between naxalite maoist and the uh, state corporate uh, army as i said uh, visiting this disaster uh, sites was overwhelming i kept thinking who is the mightiest of all one of my first encounter was uh, with this nodia fisher community fisher community nolia is a unique community because they are marine fisher basically they are marine fisher uh, they they are minority because they speak telugu uh, and living in this majority speaking odia state and they are the first victim of uh, cyclone and tsunamis and land erosion many of these fisher men uh, are now traveling they are displaced uh, they have become climate migrants and traveling to other states neighboring states as a daily wage laborer podompeta is one such nolia village which was abandoned in 2013 just before the landfill uh, landfall of uh, cyclone filin uh, it's slowly drowning in bay of bengal the village is situated in the southern part of uh, the district uh, southern district uh, in odisha once you move from cities to villages from village to empty villages and other environment disaster site you see you see how technology betrays you betrays you in every step you take technology first as highways then technology as electric poles uh, telephone towers vehicles hospitals school drinking water and food they disappeared one after another each time a link breaks with this manifestation of technology you feel you are one step closer to the apocalypse this is another nolia village uh, named uh, arjapatna when i arrived at this village uh, the women uh, nolia women were unaffected by this calamity or global warming so to speak and they were gambling this made made me to move forward uh, and i reached at konkei rehabilitation colony konkei is the name of this rehabilitation colony so one side we were seeing this land erosion and how ocean is eating villages and on the, on the other side you feel you see uh, rehabilitation colonies are built 
as built by the government for these displaced uh, and displaced fishermen. But sadly, these colonies are uh, empty because these uh, are situ situated far from the ocean and the fishermen can't fish uh, there. And uh, because the, the land they got, it's so small, they can't even cultivate. Uh, so this way, the same story of migration and displace, uh, displacement continues and multiplies. But there is also technology, free internet, chief Android phones, and online games, also porn, which, which has reached every corner of Google map. Technology gives a sense of freedom, of course, communication. So sitting in Delhi, I call to my mother every day in the night when the disaster happens or cyclone or even wind blowing or anything, my mother calls me 10 times. I also do the same and people get entertained by looking at YouTube videos or uh, um, making reels uh, and uh, watching porn. But on the other hand, a degrading environment, there is no electricity, no network, no connection, no communication, no relation, no solidarity, no justice. When I started traveling and finding stories, I lost the sense of narrative. It appeared to me as if all encountering, uh, as if I'm encountering the same story repeated again and again with the same vocabulary, same language, same visual, same spectacle. Or maybe all these stories are part of a grand narrative, which we call global warming. What fascinated me are different approaches knowledge, skills, and tools. People who use, people means, uh, people means ordinary people, the inhabitants, the natives, the tribal, the fishermen, the tool they use, or even the language. I'm also talking about language as technology. If you watch my video, Rai Sangosoro, you'll see at the end, the statement I'm making, that's the language, language as a, as a technology. And language, it's not only human who have language. The ocean has its own language, the sky, the mud, the soil, the tree, the animal, everybody has a language. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm trying to respond through that abstraction. Um, I had to invent and instrumentalize a collaborative method to make sense. I mean, to start a process of collective traveling, performance, like collective performance, collective shooting, and collectively editing. Uh, so what I did, I hired a car. With, I invited a few of my artist friends, a local group of folk singers, an engineer from government electrical department, who happened to be my, my brother, my cousin brother, uh, to participate in the process of filming, traveling, and editing and shooting, shooting and editing. Here you see Anish Cherian, he's a visual artist, architect, is trying to convert a tree into a radio by placing a copper coil antenna on the tree. It's an old technology which uh, during the first old world war, American uh, army scientists they used to communicate with other uh, colleagues. Uh, so here the plan is so that the tree will speak some stories. Uh, to bring mythological perspective, because Odisha, in Odisha, you don't find a debate on natural or um, uh, like in the context of environment disaster, you don't find debate on global warming or climate change. There are mythological stories, spirituality, religious texts, which gives us access to talk about environment disaster. So I had to bring that perspective, but how? So what I did, I brought this Dastatya group uh, uh, to perform and sing. Uh, so Daskatya is basically a folk song and dance form uh, from Odisha, where two uh, people use uh, two pieces of stick in their finger and they play. Uh, normally they sing, they travel villages to villages, uh, singing the glory of God. Here what we did uh, with one of my friend Nandan Balhavdas. He's a younger uh, artist, uh, much younger than me, uh, from Odisha. Uh, he's a researcher. 
uh, interest in mythologies and uh, Sanskrit texts and Odia texts. We collaborated and uh, composed four Daskatya songs uh, for this singer to narrate. And these songs come from Mahabharat, uh, one of the epic poem we have like Ramayana and Mahabharat and other Hindu treatise. Uh, we mix these songs from uh, with urban climate issues like bringing reference from uh, Manamata Bay or Fukushima or Chernobyl. Um, we got four narratives from the book. One is called Prabhas Saga. Prabhas Saga is a fictional uh, Prabhas Ocean. It's a contaminated ocean. Another is a fiction animal like Kokua. Kokua is very much uh, similar like uh, COVID, uh, Corona. A lot of people associate it because nobody has seen Kokua. But there is a constant fear of Kokua. In the mythology, I'm talking about the mythology. Then Eroka forest. Eroka forest is a forest which got polluted near the ocean. So it got, uh, it killed uh, the clan of God. Um, and then iron, the mace, uh, iron mace. Uh, it, it's a long narrative. I won't be able to explain everything. Then there is this Dwarika city, which got, uh, which drowned in the ocean. The city belongs to the Lord Krishna. So we brought uh, this uh, conceptual ground, five conceptual ground on which the film is based. Uh, with this narrative, we went to uh, different environment disaster sites. We performed these songs in five uh, sites uh, through the Daskatia performance. And uh, here I'm not, uh, the, the singers are not wearing the traditional costume, but I gave this, this um, PPE kit, which was, which become famous uh, after this COVID lockdown and uh, what happened with COVID and all, this sense of untouchability. And it gives this look of astronaut or science fiction or something like strange element. So here Pravas, Pravakar Maharana, Pramod Maharana and Kedanath Das, the singers are performing. Uh, this is a Kia forest. Kia grows wild near the seashore. Kia gives flower, which uh, people make, make perfume. Uh, it roots are like tentacles, which hold the ground. Uh, it's a natural barrier against land erosion. So in the film, Kia plays a character. Uh, Kia, because Kia has a bat bigger battle than, than us like humans. Uh, it's fighting against wild monkeys. It's fighting against corporate companies. And it's fi fighting against ocean. Here you see uh, Manasranjan Mahanti, uh, who is an electrical engineer working under the state government. Uh, in the film, uh, he talks about uh, his uh, work during the landfill of uh, Fani Cyclone in 2019. He actively used his mobile phone um, for documentation and reporting. His phone is kind of an archive. I was interested uh, what kind of uh, stories and narratives from, comes from his archive or from his phone. So when Manas Ranjamanti was talking about broken electric poles, and transformers, and uh, he was talking like how they had to struggle and make connections, building networks and all. I was thinking of uprooted, uprooted trees, uh, was thinking about that ancient technology or we made the, the technology which was given to us as a gift, uh, which connected all living beings. What are that technology? In an environment disaster site or landscape, everything is, is Everything is a coded message. This, this, uh, with this image, you can see the sea is muddy. Its water is not salty. And there is hardly any waves. I'm not lying. Uh, and it occasionally happens. Can anyone guess what is happening here? This is Bay of Bengal, resting like a python after devouring a flooding, flooding river. I don't know if you understood me. This, this ocean have now engulfed another river. That's why it lose its own identity. There is no waves. If you see the distance, it's all silent. There's no waves. Normally, uh, it should be like huge waves and all. And the water, when I tested, it's not salty. And the water is muddy. So that's how nature behaves. That's the, 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 the technology they have. So when I was talking about uh, the technology that connects all living being, what is the technology? I'm talking about solidarity. Uh, to be in solidarity with 
daughter, that's the technology I have, or that's the technology I aspire to be with after this project or after completing this project. Uh, thank you very much. Hope I did not take a lot of time. All right, thank you so much, um, Pari, for your presentation. Uh, so we can uh, get us some ideas about uh, your practice in relation to language as technology and also how your research has um, some impact, uh, has uh, directly um, influenced by um, your interest in nature and also the environment. So last but not least, uh, we have uh, Lawrence uh, joining us from London this morning. So working, um, so a bit about Lawrence, uh, working with video game software and also CGI animation. A London-based um, artist Lauren Slack merges real places with virtual worlds to look at how humans interact with AI and how digital images alter our experiences in the real world. So he explores world building, the creative approach of crafting an entire fictional world um, as a form of collage, and also incorporating elements from the materials and virtual worlds to develop narratives of alternative histories and also possible futures. So today he will share about uh, his practice and also in particular his award-winning work, Black Cloud. So Lawrence, whenever you're ready, uh, the screen is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the invite. Um, I'm just going to share like a kind of overview of my work over the last, I guess, um, eight or so years, showing how it relates to uh, world building and the project uh, that I made for the VH Award called Black Cloud. Um, I guess the the theme, um, oh, the theme of my talk is to do with um, memories of the future. So I've always been interested, I guess, in this idea of um, science fiction, but also what it means to create a certain uh, blend between virtual spaces and uh, lived experience. So a lot of my work draws from both like places I visited or kind of hybrid versions of uh, existing architecture. Because growing up in uh, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, I would also you know, very often see the transformation of the cityscape or the landscape in front of me in parallel with a uh, social or kind of a geopolitical and personal changes for people living there. So the main part of my uh, practice really involves CGI animation and video games. And sometimes I would um, use video games to create films, like for example, the Sinofuturist trilogy, which is Sinofuturism, Geomancer and Idol. And sometimes it's to create these ongoing video games in which sometimes they're site specific, like relating to particular places. And sometimes they're more speculative, like the word Black Cloud, which is set in a fictional smart city. Um, at the same time, the installations I make kind of create a hybrid between the virtual world and the physical environment. So sometimes there's references to the um, to the virtual space within the physical exhibition. Uh, like for example, this, this project No Tell, where, which is about a fictional ho uh, automated hotel. So thinking about how AI will affect the future of architecture and the urban environment, but also thinking how that architecture itself is, it's like a kind of science fiction or speculative vehicle because you know, I, I used to yeah, work as an architect for a long time. And I always thought it was interesting that, you know, you're kind of from a temporal timeline point, point of view, you're kind of promising the future before the thing is built. And so many different methods of representation from architectural models to architectural drawings, they're kind of very often plans for the future. And very often that future doesn't actually arise. You know, um, I'm sure we're very familiar with you know, the driving from the airport to the city center, very often you come around this area, this zone between the city and the airport that often has these, you know, unused and unbuilt skeletons of buildings. So this is like the future that didn't quite arrive. So this idea of the ruin or the building suspended at a certain state of construction is something I'm very interested in. Um, 
at the same time, like what I found very challenging, I guess, in, in contemporary art and filmmaking is to create projects which are kind of long, long term ones. So uh, I guess the bonus level series is the first time where I was starting to experiment with this idea of how do you make the site specific virtual worlds? So I would take real places where the exhibition might be, for example, the Royal Academy in London, and try to create uh, an alternate version of them that somehow acts as a commentary. So in on real estate, for example, I took uh, the building that the Royal Academy is in, which is in a former like stately home, and imagined it as if the Royal Academy had got sold to a Chinese billionaire who's investing in London property, to think about this idea of both the economics of exchange, but also this slight, um, at least in London, there's a very often a, a kind of a xenophobic attitude towards uh, foreigners, basically, even when they're foreign investors, like this fictional Chinese billionaire to migrants. Um, this more site-specific series, bonus levels, then evolved into Sinofuturism, which I guess is my largest body of work that contains the uh, video video essays, um, Sign of Futurism, and a few video games, and the new series set in Sim Beijing, which is Black Cloud, that I'll come on to. So I'm going to just talk through very quickly some of the ideas behind these works. So Sign of Futurism looks at how um, Sign of Futurism is an invisible how the link between projects and projections of Chinese industrialization and technology are kind of mediated by both fictional descriptions of them in film, uh, as well as through kind of politicized discussions. So I made the video essay as essentially a blend between different uh, between different narrative films and commentaries which were taken from YouTube about commentators talking about AI and China and how it would either be a threat generally it would be either a threat or a benefit to humanity so i felt that this discourse on sinofuturism was essentially really polarized between you know ai might save us or ai might destroy us which is very similar to the idea that you know the kind of progress somehow in in chinese technology might also somehow mirror um uh, that uh gap between how ai is viewed so somehow that China might also be the solution for certain capitalist problems because, you know, it's from a different uh, political worldview and it has a different scale. But at the same time, there's a vulnerability with a certain kind of control. So the video essay, it takes different chapters as starting points, um, like copying, computing, gaming, labor and gambling. And it takes these as certain, the ideas of how certain aspects of Chinese culture, like gambling, actually relate to different processes in machine learning. So, for example, um, the AlphaGo match you know, between Lee Sedol um, and the AlphaGo AI in 2016 was quite a seminal moment in a lot of AI research because, you know, it's this triumph of this Go playing AI against a you know human grandmaster. But I was thinking about how that relates to a certain attitude towards gambling. Uh, towards working and towards gaming as well, as some of these are both the kind of cliches that are brought up in in relation to China, but are also some uh, fundamental patterns that I wanted to discover. So I actually made Sign of Futures in the video almost um, while I was researching a uh, writing the script for a film called Geomancer, which is about an AI satellite in in Singapore. So I'll just play the uh, trailer from that so you can get a sense of the idea of all of these political questions, but somehow it's um, in my fiction films, these are rendered from a first person perspective. So in this case, I, I thought about different representations of AI, but how to reflect that on, you know, looking at it from the point of view of this um, emotional subject. 你知道看到每一波浪每一只鸟每一个动物
直到金鱼都不敢游泳的深度，而且不仅仅是看，还要记住一切，把每个细节琢刻成神经网络，永远的全面回忆。如果我有手，我会是雕塑家；如果我有声音，我会歌唱；如果我有灵魂，我会祈祷。但是我只有心灵的眼睛，所以我梦想世界。So for me, the the context of of Geomancer, which is set in the year 2065, is after this.、Um, The idea is that you know Geomancer is a weather surveillance satellite that's been tasked with looking over the changing weather conditions and global warming, rising sea levels on Earth.、Um, and because they're about to become decommissioned because it's like their lifespan is up,、um, they choose to come down to Singapore to、um, you know to see the conditions that they were created in. I thought one of the interesting paradoxes, particularly with this idea of like a conscious AI. Is that、um, you know? Whereas yeah, every individual has you know things they love and hate about, for example, their family or their social situation. Here you would have this combination of a really、um, isolated super intelligence、um, who was also completely disconnected from the place where they they were created.、Uh, so the journey of Geomancer kind of leads them through encounter different different. Subjects were also, you know, kind of victims of technology. In this case,、uh, Geomancer goes past Laika, you know, the Soviet space dog and the first kind of、uh, living creature that was artificially propelled into space. And Geomancer thinks about the, you know, the contrast or the similarity between their their fate or their life as a satellite out in space versus Laika's fate, which was, you know. A street dog from Moscow being sent up into space、um, to to both as a like symbol of technological progress, but as you know, someone as a, as a dog who died just a few seconds after takeoff.、Um, at the same time, the the cityscape of Singapore, I feel, you know, it's it's very often something very iconic. You know, Singapore,、uh, the government uses the image of Singapore as essentially a、um, uh, as a tourist. Uh, as you know, as a way to attract、uh, attract investment and tourism, so、uh, Geomancer is set in Marina Bay, which is、uh, part of、um, you know near the mouth of the Singapore River, but is also a place which is you know, half made on reclaimed land. And Geomancer like dives the satellite dives into the middle of Singapore Bay and thinks about you know how they came into being,、um, and at the same time, it's a very kind of introspective work. Because not just in this sense of like what is you know what essentially is the lonely existential AI going to feel or how are they going to relate to、um, each other? And when Geomancer comes down, they actually encounter they they see this other three D printed satellite being manufactured, and you know this is meant to indicate that they are actually you know not unique at all, and there's just always another product. To be made that is like them.、Um, this was, you know,、uh, exhibited in kind of、uh, more cinematic set- settings. And then I extended this work with a video game called Twenty Sixty Five, which I'm I'm just going to talk over here. So this was an interactive game which I made in this game engine called Unreal, and basically、um, it. Recreates the same world around Marina Bay, but from the point of view of a, a video game, basically. So the idea is that there's a video game that's been launched by this company called Farsight, who created Geomancer, and kind of like you might have, I don't know, like a Xbox or PlayStation when they you know, launch a new mega high budget game, they kind of take over a shopping center and create like you know PlayStation experience. This was also my idea for the、um, 
for the exhibition and the video game. Like the com the game design company had taken over this part of the Marina Bay Casino to kind of showcase uh, their new uh, their new project. Um, because this work is uh, interactive, it's like an open world game as opposed to Geomancer, which is a linear film, there is no actual narrative, like literal narrative or voiceover to go with it. It's all kind of clues to this world are given through the encounters you have in the game. So you might follow like a drone to explore, which leads you around the world and to explore it. Um, and at the same time, then you explore the different uh, the, the different locations which give clues about what the film has. Um, in, the, in, the, in this slide here, the player who's playing as an AI sees a sign for Geomancer being opened at the, at the museum, basically. So in the film, when the satellite comes down to Earth, they realize that not only are they this kind of you know, corporate military product, but also they, they've in Singapore, they've kind of created this exhibition, you know, commemorating their existence on National Day. Um, and the reason it's set in 2065 is, you know, it's uh, that would be a hundred years after the um, you know, National Day of Singapore, you know, the when it um when it you know, became independent as a country and split from uh, Malaysia. And so yeah, the 9th of August is yeah, National Day. And when I was growing up, I always thought it was very strange but interesting that. You know the idea that the national identity is something that's manufactured both through the cityscape and also through these um you know kind of large-scale mass events um the exhibition in k11 in hong kong is the same view as the as the video game so as you know uh like in in, in this image um the site where k11 actually is is right next to basically an underground path to lead to the subway station and so people from outside can see kind of into this video game world so um the the audience can go through and play the game on a console um as well as watch geomancer and then play the game from a different perspective so they kind of enter into a physical space then into a game space then into a cinematic space and then into a different version of the game space so what i found is you know pe different people have different entry points into an artwork very often like um depending on you know what their interests are and what their background is so sometimes people like to play and then watch a film and and sometimes they want to watch and understand the the kind of world that's around and then kind of engage with the game um, which is a different you know starting point uh, so the sequel to Geomancer is a film called Idol, where um, whereas Geomancer really looks specifically at um, um, at the idea of uh, looking and seeing because Geomancer is a satellite. Like some people said, you know, they really like the soundtrack for Geomancer. So I thought for the, the sequel to it, um, I would set it um, instead of Singapore in the Malaysia uh, Gunting Highlands, which, you know, which is about an hour's drive away from Kuala Lumpur. Um, and it's essentially this, uh, you know, this gambling resort that was built on a kind of state border. But I thought in a future version of Gunting, because it's kind of known for, you know, kind of gambling and pleasure and stuff like that, it would actually be set at a time where, you know, the whole entertainment industry has moved online. So it's a slightly sad landscape. And it centers around um, music and the brief plot is there's a singer who uh, whose you know career has taken a dive recently and and she enlists geomancer uh, who's you know super intelligent and can do everything so she enlists geomancer to help her ghost write her, her next album so i'll just play the trailer for that now Dang 
我们的世界已经由外转向里。机器学习只导致了通用的规则，这是人工智能的真正遗产吗？在没有建筑师的情况下生成建筑，没有音乐家的音乐，没有影响者的影响。在四十年代的时候 ，Temple 真的很活跃。我每晚都去，我在那儿遇到了所有的明星、制片人和设计师，这是我全部的生命。So yeah, I mean, although the theme is both AI and technology, it's it's really to do about the, you know,、um, the effects that an over reliance have might have even from a kind of creative point of view. So you know, the the trailer is about this, you know, existential question about when any kind of music could be made. What would the role of the author be in this in this context?、Um, So I'm just going to go through very quickly through some of the other kind of projects, as you know,、uh, just not to take up too much time.、Uh, so different ways that these projects keep on being extended is sometimes they start as films, become games, become another film, and in this case, become、uh, an actual album.、Uh, so you know, I'm very interested in the idea of a soundtrack and how it relates to a. The look of a film and the experience of it, and how sound and music works in video games, and Temple was kind of an extension or kind of like a recreation of、uh, Diva's Club in Idol,、um, and you know you kind of have this walk through、uh, accompanied by music videos, and then I kind of made and released the soundtrack and released that,、um, and because it's a video game. Sometimes I also do kind of like live performances, where essentially I, you know, like do a walkthrough of of the world and mix a soundtrack live. This was from、uh, 2019, just after the um uh, uh the installation was was made. So kind of fast forward to the、uh, VH Award in Black Cloud. It was such a great opportunity developing this during the residency. So. I think basically what happened was from June till Aug,、uh, June till September 2021 last year. You know,、um, all of us VH、uh, uh, VH residents would would kind of meet every week or two and you know talk through our, our ideas.、Um, I had this like long-standing idea that since you know Geomancer and Idol was set in Southeast Asia,、um, where you know I was thinking about ideas of Migration in relation to like AI and my own experience, I would set Black Cloud、uh, in this、uh, ghost city, this ghost town called、um, Sin Beijing, and it basically follows、uh, a self-driving car who's also essentially having、um, existential issues. You know, they're they're a self-driving car, but they're in a ghost town because the whole reason that the you know place had been built had you know become unnecessary. And it was interesting thinking also over you know over lockdown and and still yeah very much right now、um, the idea of the control of a society and an environment is very I mean obviously very political but also creates certain psychological states of feeling very like you know trapped in your home trapped in your city so that contrast between. I, The contrast between the idea of a car, a self-driving car, or especially in cinematic terms, you know, the idea of a road movie where you can kind of freely explore the highway、um, and you know escape reality, versus the kind of lived 
experience of surveillance or having to be in one place all the time. So in a way, um, this self-driving car and the smart city were about this network of uh, a car that could potentially be free, but is still under strict surveillance all, all the time. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna play a, a couple of minutes from, from the film and that will be it. 你能描述一下你今天遇到的问题吗? 我很难过,大家都离开了这么久。你确定大家都离开了吗? 我可以看到发生的一切,无处不在,无时无刻。我的职责是看管这座城市,照顾好汽车,确保没有人受伤。现在没人了。这便是一座鬼城，我无事可做。你还感觉到什么？即使和你说话，我也无法摆脱自己。你说。So so, um, this dialogue is meant to be between the you know self uh the the surveillance system black cloud and the uh, kind of built-in self-help therapist who's an AI called Guan Yin. So this idea of uh, the psychological states of an AI who has different limitations placed on it is, you know, something that's been, I've been thinking about since uh, basically geomancer and idol, like what is the cost of intelligence, but at the, at the price of freedom. Um, so it's a dialogue between uh, two AIs essentially, but of course it's all happening inside a kind of algorithms consciousness. And the landscapes of Sim Beijing, like both the kind of entry point, this like desolate cityscape, you know, with half-built skyscrapers in the background, versus the idea of driving through the wilderness is a kind of contrast, I guess, a psychological contrast that you know is really um the film is really looking at. Um, so, you know, these symbols of, of surveillance from surveillance camera or cars scanning the environment is contrasted against different aspects of nature, both the landscape and, you know, there's this character of uh, a fox who wanders around and is actually, I guess, the symbol of the wilderness or the idea of nature in, in the midst of all this um, complex ideas about AI and surveillance. And the short film kind of ends with an encounter between these three um, three characters, really, who inhabit the landscape. You know, there's a, a, a human kind of AI engineer, there's a self-driving car, and the, the Arctic fox as different ways of looking at, you know, this technological landscape, which is both, you know, completely artificial, like literally through the CGI, that's how it's been made, but also somehow quite natural in this blending of like the urban landscape and nature as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much, um, Lawrence, for this co very comprehensive um, presentation. Uh, and it gives us a new insight on uh, the world building and also um, your uh, personal interest to mix um, um, sign of futurism as well, and I'm sure it will um, lead to interesting discussions with, uh, with uh, the artists as well, the other artists. So um, with that um, presentations, uh, that means we can now go into the second part of this uh, discussion. Um, so now I will invite Asri to host the discussion with uh, all the artists, uh, Shawara, Pari, and also Lawrence. Um, so Asri, uh, whenever you're ready, um, let's start the discussion. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Nimi. Uh, sorry for uh, the earlier connection problem. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, first, I, I would like to thank all of the artists uh, that are joining this uh, discussion session uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Shaura. Thank you, Pari and Lawrence. Um, I think that's a very, uh, that was a very, very insightful presentation from uh, both of you three guys. Um, I think um, 
one of the most uh, interesting uh, facts that I got from the presentation is how you uh, each respond to uh, the technology, uh, the new media, uh, and how you all try to illustrate uh, various social, cultural, economic, or, or political and eco ecological issues uh, in your own way uh, using the technology. Uh, I find I found uh, one very, I think, a uh, very interesting uh, thread uh, thread in all of uh, your works is uh, the contrast between how uh, you know, like whether the technology is actually a threat or something beneficial uh, for all of us. Um, and I guess uh, before I have one, perhaps one question for uh, all the three of you. Uh, but before that, perhaps I would like to start from Shaura first. <laughs> um, Shaura, I, um, you mentioned uh, about how uh, this work that you presented in the VH board is the last part of your uh, trilogy uh, works. and. Uh, uh, the first is Astronaut's Family Area uh, and Nomad's Land Identity Card, the Vatus Land at Fair, Fluidity of uh, Future Machines. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned about your uh, practice with paper, soil, and uh, water. I mean, your exploration of those elements. Uh, would you mind to perhaps like elaborate more on that, uh, on those? Uh, uh, three videos, like what's the connection, what's the story behind it? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main point that uh, the starting point of the trilogy is the paper, right? So uh, water and soil is the two base elements to create paper. And it's all, they also uh, represent, in the past, uh, war is about um, land acquisitions. So that's why it's, it's represented by soil. And in the future, it's more about technology, um, like um, the invention or uh, uh, use, using of technology. And all of technology, uh, in my knowledge, are always related to water even every materials like our clothes, uh, our computers, uh, which made from metals are processed by water. So it's related closely with those elements. Um, and yeah, about paper, it's more about uh, educational, uh, formal education uh, representative, because in here we still use a lot of papers and um, administrative works, uh, complicated, but I don't know in other places anyway. I mean, um, yeah, I think that's it. But uh, it's also related to migrations, all of them, hmm. because uh, land acquisitions, water use, and um, education are all all related to how people negotiate with each other from different places and culture. Okay. Uh, how do you think it has a relation uh, with, you know, like um, where you grow up? Like, I mean, where you come from? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's all related to where I came from. Um, I moved a lot since I was a kid um, in Indonesia, particularly. And um, a, when making fluid of future machines, I am more related to it in the sense of my childhood because I always live in an island and I can swim before anything else. And uh, if related, relating to the fattest land at the fair, I also came from a mixed background. Well, in Indonesia, there are a lot of... Um, uh, people from many places have different culture. What is it called? <laughs> like uh, ethnicities. I came from two different 
ethnicities and um, the cultural uh, clash are quite can be felt uh, anytime everywhere and my friends also have similar problems even until now and um, the situation itself in here right now in my opinion it's not really uh, going too far from what happens in the past so yeah uh, okay. and it's all because maybe it's education thank you uh Shaura. Uh, before we go to the next question, uh, and before we, you know, like uh, dive into these uh, questions further <laughs> or this is discussion further, I guess my next question would be for Pari. Uh, Pari, you you gave a very comprehensive uh, presentation about, you know, like the background of your practice, uh, you know, background of yourself as well and how you develop as an artist uh, in your hometown and, and et cetera. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, like you have focused on your, uh, you have focused uh, on an ecological concert on your hometown and then how you develop it. Uh, into work and uh, I really, really interested uh, when you said that how technology sometimes can betray you as well and uh, how you illustrate, you know, like the gap uh, of perhaps the development be between your uh, hometown Orisa and Delhi where you are based now. Um, and um, but you also mentioned that sometimes technology gives you a sense of freedom. Uh, I just, uh, I think that's uh, probably like, uh, if I can say uh, more or less what we experience in Indonesia as well, you know, like because of the diversity, like uh, what Shaura just mentioned with the ethnicity, with the, you know, like our, uh, uh, geographical condition as well. Uh, we have a lot of problems with uh, access to, you know, like some, uh, certain areas in Indonesia. And so it's not, you know, like uh, the same. Uh, and how are you dealing with that condition? And, you know, like, can you elaborate more on that process and how you, you process all the, those facts and information? Uh, I don't know if I understood the question correctly, <laughs> but about the question, about the technology, uh, I'm also like it's not straightforwardly. I'm saying it's betrays all the time. I'm also you know there is two way like one way we live and another way where you intellectually uh, try to cultivate it or make arguments and all. Uh, the place I come from, like Odisha or India. Here, technology can be very intimate, like the question of technology can be very intimidating you know, from the, uh, the socio-cultural perspective. Even politically also, when we look at technology, like what happened in uh, from uh, 2014, uh, one of the like uh, big pro propaganda from the right-wing government was uh, cashless economy. So they introduced the demonetization like one night, the prime minister came to a TV and, and that's the TV he came to. And he said uh, that uh, now the two currencies are like, they disappeared, it's no, it doesn't have any value. And uh, they said it because uh, they thought like it's going to reduce black money or terrorism or something. And they propagated uh, this cashless economy and another propaganda through the technology. How I'm talking about the technology that comes to our head or you know, we encounter in public life. Another was this biometric uh, government tried to collect biometric through Aadhaar card. The we make uh, uh, identity card, which government imposes on everything. Uh, whereas your court, the Supreme Court says it's not mandatory. But if you go to the bank, you want to open an account, you want to like do anything. And the bank person says, no, you need the other card. So it goes in a two different directions. So you, with the uh, technology, you always feel intimidated. You know? So I, I, I'm also confused. Like when I go to my village, 
uh, I see people having the iPhone, uh, like 11 or 9 or something, the model, but they would have three camera cover. Uh, with this cover, they would have three, ca three camera. And that's how they flaunt, okay, I have this technology, but they're not using their, because in, originally they have only two camera or one camera. So what that talks, what, how it talks about the people who are living or inhabiting or uh, consuming this technology. So that's how I became apprehensive about it. And then this corporate company, which is exploiting us from all perspective, they made the internet free. And uh, that's how uh, you find uh, everybody has free internet. So they, they basically promoted porn film. Uh, you find everybody like sitting in the villages and all like watching porn all the time. So, but I'm speaking very generally, uh, it's not, uh, uh, but it's a discourse. Uh, yeah, so that's how I am apprehensive about this idea of technology. But also I'm try trying to take it more positively. <laughs> <laughs> Am I answering you, answering you correctly or I'm speaking something else? Yeah. <laughs> Not for technology, we're, we were, we're, we, will, we won't be here, you know, at this moment talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, uh, for Lawrence, I'm, yeah, I'm very impressed by your presentation. <laughs> I think it's a bit, a lot to absorb. <laughs> I mean, so many informations. <laughs> but uh, how do you feel? Like uh, you know, like you mentioned, you you've been like uh, uh, you live in Singapore, and then you moved to Hong Kong, and then now you're in London. Um, is that is there any you know like difference? Uh, how how you develop like along? all those uh, movements like and how does it I think affects your practice I'm just wondering yeah I know it's a great question I, I think because I mean I'm, I'm I moved to London when I was 11 so it's it's not, not oh, like okay. I had much of a practice then but um, <laughs> I think de definitely you know when I was um, in, in in Hong Kong and Singapore what I'm trying to say is that the I feel the changes just very broadly, you know, the changes in the country or like how I could see the infrastructure changing, the public services changing it was very much, you know, kind of happening in real time. And I was also very, I think even though very, very young, you know, the, the, the kind of media, basically public propaganda was like, you know, a huge part of that. When I was in, in Hong Kong, you know, it was, it was before, 97 so it was before the handover so it was still you know kind of somehow this weird part of the UK but I, I do distinctly remember that you know it has this feeling of like uncertainty um, even from a kind of economic perspective I got the sense that there was a lot of and you know I was like seven years old but still you see things changing all the time right but there was a, a sense that it's like, you know, HSBC bank or whatever it is. You, they really basically want to cash in on this final stage of like freedom before uncertainty happens. You know, it's like boom times in the 80s, uncertainty in the early 90s and so on, um, because they don't kind of know what's happening. And of course, it's still that hasn't changed that much. Um, but the relationship of obviously, you know, it's totally different context, but they're both kind of small islands right so yes. I, I i kind of felt that singapore is like this kind of you know post-colonial neoliberal capitalist case study you know um it's a just interesting contrast to that because they're also both places that are so linked to co colonialism and empire but also financial wealth and I mean, we're talking about technology, but, you know, financial technology, basically everything from like maritime shipping, Hong Kong stock market, proximity to China and things like that. So it's like when I, you know, 20 over years later, when I was thinking back about these experiences, I had you know quite a lot to draw from. Uh, like what I was showing in my presentation, I guess my early work is very much like site specific. So I was thinking like, where am I at this moment in time? And then a bit later on, I could think back about, you know, what was going on basically when I was a kid and how are these patterns 
still continuing today, which yeah, they they really are. Um, but I I felt that my um, I guess it it also gave me a perspective both as like you know insider and outsider to kind of understand the patterns, but also you know reflect reflect on them from outside because you know I would go back to Singapore and Malaysia maybe every year, so mm. I'd see you know like snapshots certain things change, certain things uh, stay the same. And with these snapshots, somehow, I mean, I feel you get a very different perception of change than if you live somewhere all the time, because, you know, continuous change versus, versus like discrete changes, you know, mm -hmm. perceive, you, you can perceive it uh, quite differently, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, uh, before, uh, I mean, now we are also receiving questions from uh, friends and families who are joining this uh, discussions. So please feel free to uh, send uh, over your uh, questions uh, through the chat box uh, in the Zoom or, or in the YouTube as well. Uh, but before that, I have uh, one more questions for all this, uh, for all you guys. <laughs> um, I think this is a very, very general question, but uh, I just would like to know, like, how uh, is your observation or response or take on new media art? Like, uh, because uh, I know, Lawrence, uh, last time you couldn't make it, but uh, I had a pretty interesting chat with uh, Pari about, you know, like, the, the uh, how to redefine. Uh, new media art and I guess uh, yeah I just would like to know from all uh, of you guys perhaps we can start from uh, Shaura <laughs> selalu korban pertama <laughs> oke okay. um, new media art um, I don't know it some someone also asked in the media preview right uh, I think yeah, yeah, of course. Answer uh, still the same. Yeah, and I know that you've been a lot. Uh, you you've been experimenting with a lot of different uh, materials, different mediums. So I just would like to know your your take on, on when you yeah, work with, I, you know <laughs> new media art. <laughs> I think new media art is promising, of course, because we already get used to see LEDs, and um, and yeah. It's it's always um, what we use in art. What kind of materials always related, highly related to what many people use every day. And new media art is already since 17, 18, 80s, seventies, and it will still develop. I don't know until when. Uh, how do you feel like, you know, like transitioning between all these different mediums because you work with paper before, you've uh, made sculptures, uh, how do you feel when you work with this new, not new, but this technology? Um, uh, well, in my practice, it's like, um, I just do what I can <laughs> with my background. <laughs> <laughs> with my knowledge from yeah science both science and philosophy and arts mm. yeah I just explore and I like it I I like to do explorations with materials so um so yeah uh, not really feels in an extreme changes but I just do what I can <laughs> yeah how about you, buddy? Uh, <laughs> hearing Sharam, I was more like laughing a lot. So I was in, uh, because she mentioned about Leon, uh, neon light. I was in Athens uh, once. Uh, I was walking on the street from the back. There is this guy came and uh, he called me to this uh, bar, uh, which was full of neon light. And I, I, and I was like, it was my first day and uh, I just went out of the residency just to have some food. I just landed and uh, it was neon light and then this lady came with bikini and with a champagne glass. 
and he saw she saw me and this guy was talking oh you are from india without talking to me or knowing anything about me this man got to know that i am from india and he told me that uh, where are you from oh where are you from in india i said i am living in delhi and he suddenly said oh my brother is living there and he told few names of the place and this uh, she, uh, this guy invited the, the the girl the girl brought a champagne and they charged me 90 euros uh, the i think and the and the learning for me was never enter to a neon where to a space where there is neon lights so that's the conclusion i, I got i was completely unaware that it's a sex shop and um, they serve you, you know so so technology is always intimidating for me so new media is the same way i understand technology so as i just told you before in art uh, schools here we nobody teach uh, you video performance or any technological or even photography is not part of the course there are certain schools which is where students they learn applications uh, softwares on their own they do that experimentally but uh, you know in a pedagogical way through the like dark room you wash your negatives make uh, you don't we don't have those facilities maybe in few rare elite school we have that so it always like uh, it's always you know when i was studying in uh, odisha i did not have any facility i came to delhi then i got to exposed to it um i have problem with new media in the context of my topic uh, like environment disaster that when new media claims that they will bring experience they will make you experience the reality uh, that's where i have problem you know this 3 3d vr or ar technology which gives you all senses and uh, you know water or anything like you feel okay you are on the spot i have a uh, problem with that idea when art claims to bring experience to you uh, because where i feel you are detached from the reality or you are out of that reality then you don't need even um those uh, no nature uh, because you have created your created your ac room air conditioned room so you don't need the trees you don't need uh, so th- that's where i find it difficult yeah that's my answer oh sorry i was me <laughs> okay okay the last one lawrence <laughs> how about okay. you cuz <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, you've been experimenting with like CGI and uh, you know like video games and stuff. Uh, uh, how are you developing and uh, and how do you you know like uh, I think uh, instead of just not developing but also like uh, experimenting with the with the new media. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, it's again, it's like quite. Mm. organic i guess for me it's like this mm. you know it, how should i say for me like n- new media i only say new media when i have to talk about things in like an art historical sense you know um of course. I, 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 so i think um you know going back to actually what parry was saying about like the neon lights for example right cuz nowadays you know we can talk about like new media as an artwork in a frame but even when you're in let's say in the cityscape right um mm. the light that you see today at night is very different from 10 years ago 20 or 30 years ago so i feel you know f- because i'm you know draw so much from like urban experience and somehow like abstract that into my work i try and stay conscious of like how the look of the city changes so like for example in london and hong kong now it's no longer just signs but it's like whole led walls and that's changing as well like today when you see a neon light it's most likely you know like an led in a tube it's not actual neon gas with the starters which looks which has a actually very different quality to it but you need a different um you know it's a lot more difficult to to keep in that state so you know oh like Dan Flavin or whatever you know artists who use like actual neon light and spe- specify like it has to look like this um whereas i'm like if it costs like 5 dollars from amazon it's it's more just a light um so what i'm trying to say is yeah like of course new media in 
in an um, artistic setting is very much defined like by is it photography is it like kinetic art is it right. cgi and so on but you know the, the the way that like literally the world looks is on a very ambient level and a very kind of wide level also affected by those things um and actually the the reason i was started doing a lot of 3d and cgi is um because i ran it's literally because maybe the artistic context is different here so i literally ran out of space and money to to, to make and fabricate things um because i think when one of the things for example when you're studying is you have shared workshops you have facilities you have somewhere to store things and actually at least for me when you know i got a small st tiny studio when i started my practice like 10 15 years ago after a while you just kind of run out of space so the earliest yeah projects were really like how do i make an installation without physically making an installation i guess um, and there's definitely limitations with that, but I felt like, you know, the, the virtual worlds gave a certain freedom to experiment with like speculative architecture that I, I just didn't have the um, uh, ability to otherwise, yeah. Thank you. That's <laughs> very, very interesting um, answer, I guess. I mean, um, yeah, I guess uh, from all of you uh, guys, uh, the reason why I asked about, you know, like the fact that uh, does the technology relates to uh, where did you come from? Like, I think it has a very, very tight uh, relationship with, uh, you know, like the geographical facts as well. Like where do we live and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that's the reason why I uh, uh, perhaps a bit curious about, you know, like, Mm, how uh, each of you guys approach uh, this uh, technology and how does it work in your, you know, like each of uh, our own society, like uh, our home country, because I believe it's uh, different uh, realities for uh, everyone uh, here. Um, uh, we're nearing the end of this uh, discussion discussion session, but uh, we have one question from the one of the friend that uh, that's joining uh, this discussion. This is for all of you three guys. Um, uh, the question is: uh, Speaking of art and uh, technology, what do you all think of the AI generated uh, painting and art in metaverse? Uh, okay. Who would like to start first? <laughs> no, Shaura. <laughs> now I ask, who would like to start first? <laughs> okay, can you go in, uh, Lawrence. Re yeah. in reverse order? <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, in, in 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 Geomancer in the in the film, there's a. Uh, part of it is like a neural network generated sequence. So the film is 48 minutes long and about 40 minutes in, there's a two minute kind of dream sequence that's made by processing, processing the first like 40 minutes of film. And, you know, it it's like five years ago now, so it's quite low res, but you get this idea. I mean, it looks AI generated. So even the um, you know current generation of uh, AI generative algorithms, um, DALI, stable diffusion, this kind of mid journey, um, they all you know, have the, a certain look because you know, whether it's you know, the image is generated through text or whether it's generated through a, a different kind of prompt, um, it will, to a certain extent, look like the algorithm. And so, I mean, from a user perspective let's say because it it turns the artist is you know into a uh you know software consumer because you it constrains the possibilities into typing in search terms and of course it makes things much much easier um they have their own stamp of aesthetic but at the same time it lowers the skill required to generate images to the point where you know it's it's a mass consumer technology um 
which is both, I think, interesting, obviously, for like a large amount of people who don't see themselves as artists and just want to like mess around with some software. Um, it it creates like, but if you're like a professional artist, it creates a question of like, what what does that mean for me, both as a producer and as you know a high as a trained creative, basically. Um, I often think of the parallel with uh, music production, for example, that now music production, whether it's like different programs like Logic or Ableton or whatever, they make, or, or you know, hardware synthesizers or even guitars, they're continuously being made easier to get to get into music or music production, uh, which is a great thing in a, on a social level but also it creates like a huge flood of content basically. So I think in, in a similar way, AI generated stuff is, is similar because it's lowered the challenge of creation. It creates a huge amount of content, which is a universal thing um, that generates different questions about like, what's the value of it? Because also, you know, the value of my AI generated artwork versus someone else's is, a couple of words basically so i think it's yeah it's different set of challenges because this in a sense like skill to enter has changed but it's you know that's also in general a technological challenge you know versus like a artistic one as well um, <laughs> <laughs> Let me share. So these are the first uh, image I did uh, using AI pod. Uh, like there is this broken building. So I did this, but I feel it's like a joke or something. Uh, but in my, like uh, the current uh, project I'm working on, that's uh, where I use AI, but it's more like uh, using this uh, AI for weather forecasting, where we are collecting sky images. I'm trying to read sky image uh, through AI algorithm and uh, will weather forecast it. I'm not a great fan of uh, this uh, AI converting uh, images to this like painting style or something. Yeah. Stop sharing your skin here, buddy. Um, AI generated artwork. Um, I think all of us using them in terms of, I mean, the process maybe, but yeah, um, if we talk about the final product, I think like uh, what kind of paint? Uh, I think it's just a different segment. I mean, even four of us, uh, five of us have different approach to create our artwork and have different segments. And yeah, so it's just the same like that in my point of view. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you perhaps like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you see it as a, just, you know, like another kind of, uh, medium like or... yeah yes like another kind of mediums yeah. uh, but we all, all also use that yeah. but in the final yeah. product yeah it's it's just different kind of mediums mm -hmm. some people use it only for the process some people use it uh in every every form of their works mm -hmm. um I mean, uh, Hiara, baby, do you like have, uh, you know, because now, yeah, with the, of course, like, bukan uh, crypto apa ya? NFT? NFT and stuff, uh, you know, like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's already, out there and uh, and that's obviously something <laughs> new. Yeah, it's obviously something. For all of us. But yeah. 
back back to our what we discussed before it's really depends on the uh, geography locations and mm. how the social economic conditions happen in mm. uh, particular places mm. okay um i guess uh, nindi we're nearing uh, the end of this session yeah Yeah, I think yes, actually. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <We've done> <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um all right, I guess uh, we have to close uh, the session now. Uh we're running out of time. Uh I mean, of course we would all uh, still would like to uh, continue this uh, discussion, of course. <laughs> I think two hours is not enough to discuss all of these uh, things. <laughs> But uh, yeah, sadly, we have to uh, close the session now. Uh, before that, uh, I would uh, like to say thank you to all uh, of uh, the three artists. Thank you, Shaura, Pari, and Lawrence uh, for joining us in this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for all the friends uh, who have joined the session. as well uh, hope to see you guys uh, in the next uh, museum agents public program so yeah over to you Lindy all right thank you so much uh, Asri uh, so yeah that's been the discussion for uh, VH award thank you everyone for your energy insights and also this uh, engaging discussion uh, I suppose uh, From this two hour discussion, we can see how um, a wide range of ideas and also insights that explore media technology and also media art um, and how it can be used as a way to respond to the issues uh, around our uh, localities. So um, congratulations uh, once again to all the artists for your achievement at VH Award. And uh, to our audience, uh, you can still, uh, you can watch um, the videos by all these artists and also the two uh, other artists who are the finalists for uh, this uh, fourth VH Award. Uh, in Museum Machan. Uh, the exhibition and uh, the presentation runs until November 13th. So do make your way into the museum to experience it yourself. And for the latest news on upcoming programs and also exhibitions at Museum Machan, uh, please follow us on our social media, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and also TikTok. So on that note, um, I'd like to close this session. So uh, stay safe, take care, and also have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.